Well, thank you, Sue, very much. Um, Joe, uh, loved your talk. I mean, um, and uh, I like the, the expression you used, um, an opinion contrary to world opinion. That expression you used. Well, what I'm giving you now is a view contrary to all world opinion in psychiatry. And like Herb Green, I'm sure that I'm right. But we also... We know have, that you're right, John. But we also randomized trials to show it. Um, a couple of months ago, I went to a, a lecture on, um, on medicine in classical Greece and Rome. And um, there was Derrida Hippocrates with a quote, which he could have written for my beliefs of depression in women. Doctors often make mistakes by not learning the cause, by accurate questioning. See, it's all in the history. It's all in, what I'm talking about is in the history. But they proceed to heal as if they were men's diseases. One thing is very clear that depression in women is very different for depression in men. And we'll sort that out. Apart, depression, apart from making people incapable of work and their family and so on, um, it also has other major side effects. There's more heart attacks, more strokes, more hypertension, more Alzheimer's, more osteoporosis. People forget that. Women on de with depression and on antidepressive uh, drugs um, have much more uh, um, osteoporosis and um, non-suicidal deaths, etc. Now, what we should call this thing is reproductive depression, because in the history, you will be aware of the peaks of depression that occur at times of hormonal changes. And it's a premenstrual depression, it's postnatal depression, and climacteric depression, and particularly in the menopause of transition in the two or three years before the period stopped. Now, we all know that, don't we? We all know that, that the depression occurs in women premenstrually, postnatally, and around the menopause. I mean, that's no secret to any of us, but it's a secret to psychiatrists who haven't learned that yet. Now, there are two other aspects in reproductive depression. One, when they have PMS, they invariably are in a good mood during pregnancy. When the hormone levels are high and constantly in a good mood. They get postnatal depression, as I explained before. And then when the periods come back, the PMS returns. And then they go into the climactic depression, age 45 or so. And all these things have been shown to respond to estrogens. Now, at the end of my lecture, I'll give you an audit of uncontrolled data. Now, I know it's uncontrolled, but it's been published. Um, I just want you to be aware that there are these controlled studies here. Um, Premenstrual depression, this first paper was on implants 30 years ago and more. And then <clears throat> Neil Watson, Mike Savas, that was Easter Dial Patches. The postnatal depression uh, from the Maudsley, uh, and um, that was on patches. Climactic depression, that was on implants and soirees on, uh, on patches. So we have this whole group of, of randomized controlled trials published in The Lancet and the BMJ, which show dramatically and convincingly that a lot of serious depression and even depression that's failed to respond to antidepressants gets better, is cured with transdermal estrogens. And still the psychiatrists re refuse to accept that. Now, <clears throat> P PMS, or the Americans call it premenstrual dysphoric disorder in their DSM-4. It's interesting, that name, because it's just severe PMS. But it comes from their DSM-4. And the DSM-4, big book like this, where every sort of emotion, mood, anxiety is itemized, 
It has one function, that's reimbursement. Reimbursement in the American system. And then, apart from calling it, because dysphoric, we don't use the word dysphoric. Um, I suppose it means the opposite to euphoric, but it's not a word we use. But psychiatrists use it, so therefore it's a psychiatric condition. And even then they get it wrong because they frequently misdiagnose it as bipolar condition. Because it doesn't respond to antidepressants, why should it? And they give another antidepressant, and another one, and it's still cyclical, so it must be bipolar. And then the woman's got a real problem. Treatment of PMS, then, is to keep them away from psychiatrists. Now, that's number one lesson. And we know as regards hormones, in general terms, Easterns usually improve mood. Testosterone usually improves mood, energy, and libido. And progesterone often produces depression, tiredness, and bloating. So what we're talking about now is is the administration of, of one, two, or three of these hormones. Estrogen good, testosterone very good, progesterone not good, but required to protect the endometrium. So first of all, we're going to treat depression, the correct diagnosis. Now, what I want to stress is that you cannot measure hormone depression by blood tests. The women I'm talking about will all have normal hormone levels. They'll have a low FSH, they'll have a normal or high estradiol because they're all premenopausal, all premenopausal. So you cannot, you know, the poor woman says, I've got a hormonal depression, it's my hormones, go to the GP or the gynecologist and takes blood, they're normal. Of course they're normal. You can't diagnose it by blood tests, and what's more, you can't exclude it by blood tests. It's in, as Hippocrates said, it's in the history. Relationship to periods, did they have PMS as a teenager? History of a good mood during pregnancy? History of postnatal depression often has these somatic symptoms of headaches, bloating, and they have runs of good days a month. Often becomes worse than the menopausal tra transition. So there we are. <coughs> so PMS is caused by cyclical hormonal changes following ovulation. And the effect of treatment of severe PMS should be based on the abolition of these changes by suppression of ovulation. Now this we can do in several ways. Um, transdermal estrogens have been shown in studies to work. I tend to use gels now. I use gels, mostly estrogel, two or three measures a day, or implants. They work very well. Try to get the blood levels up to 600 picomoles in order to suppress cycles. Or you can't use GNRH analogs, as, <coughs> as Sean O'Brien has, has pioneered over the years, to remove the cycles, and then you add back tibolone or something to stop the flushes and sweats. Also, consider testosterone for depression and libido. So now we're left with transdermal estrogens, the gels, um, um, the, the, the estrogel, and also the, 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 the testin, the, the, the not licensed for women, but the testosterone gels. Um, require cyclical progesterone or marina IUS, and, but the women often don't like progesterone because the PMS women are progesterone intolerant. They don't like it. So these women sometimes end up with a hysterectomy in PSO and estrogen testosterone. This is a study from, from um, Bob Reed in Canada. 14 women unresponsive conservative therapy um, had a TH BSO and lasting r relief. It's a study of ours, 47 <coughs> patients over 10 years. So there's only about four or five patients a year. Um, and these had a hysterectomy in BSO. 
and they were virtually all very satisfied or, 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 or satisfied. So it's a very effective treatment and not a last chance. You know, um, um, therapy, these women say are 45, they've got three children. They don't want five years of misery. They don't want five years of the potential cancer in these um, bits of the pelvis. Transformed estrogen and testosterone, always necessary after history and BSO. Um, bipolar. Now, a psychiatrist, it's interesting now that we have this link. Um, uh, 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 psychiatrists, uh, uh, as I said, often misdiagnose PMS and, and call it bipolar. But they've made a new discovery, these psychiatrists. They now recognize that women with bipolar have more postnatal depression, more, fivefold more. What they're missing, of course, is not bipolar, it's PMS. Women with PMS certainly have more postnatal depression. They've just got to get the diagnosis right, and then we may get somewhere. Okay, so I've written up 10 patients who, 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 who like this, who, who had their PMS misdiagnosed with bipolar. This is 10 of them. Um, first seen patient of mine, many inpatient visits for manic depression, three separate months in the priory hospital. PMS is a teenager, two kids, good mood during pregnancy, and nine months of breastfeeding, because they like breastfeeding, these women, um, and then postnatal depression. SSIs didn't help, East Isle patch, 99% better, like pregnancy, gels, implant, progesterone intolerant, had hysterectomy, um, well, no depression and no antidepressants. And I've asked these patients, <laughs> I've asked these patients, these 10 patients, to give me a one-line summary of how, what it was all about. And she said, doctors don't understand what a near-death experience cycles can produce. Now, this is one of my oldest and dearest friends. There are many people in the audience who know who I'm talking about. Joe, Mike, Bob, I think. It's an old girlfriend of mine who uh, we're doing our PhDs together. She was doing it in Charles Dickens, and I was on the kidney. And, and um, she was a, a crazy American feminist. And she, at the age of 30, got herself sterilized to make sure she never had children. She wanted her rights as a woman, etc. No children, and she's now a successful academic and author. Now, when I told her over the telephone that I'm writing up 10 women whose PMS of misdiagnosis bipolar. She said, well, I've got bipolar as well, which I didn't know. Diagnosed bipolar in the States, age 20. Lithium for two years, antidepressants for 20 years. And she was sterilized, not because of her feminism, but because of misdiagnosis. Misdiagnosed bipolar when she was a 20-year-old and got herself sterilized. Um, breastfeeding. And this is terribly interesting. Um, and I've only just become aware of this, that prolonged breastfeeding is very healthy, it's protective, and there because of no cycles. And I very recently had a patient that I'd seen years ago who was a self-harmer, self-harmed so much, her arms were tattooed. And the self-harming only occurred premenstrually. Very good. It proves my lecture. Um, <coughs> now, now, I didn't see her for two or three years, because she, she was better, she was better. And then her mother phoned me, she was ill again and self-harming. What had happened, what had happened is that she had my treatment for a few, six months, got pregnant, was very well, breastfed for a year, was terrific, stopped breastfeeding, PMS comes back, starts cutting herself again. So that's one example. Another example, rather more tragic, is this one here. When I wrote up my 10 cases of, of bipolars cured by hormones, I, I, I also wrote up this failure. A woman from Nottingham, 50-year-old woman, diagnosed with postnatal oppression of bipolar, um, 
attempted suicide 19 months after the birth of the baby. She survived, but the baby died. The depression started years previously, moderate premenstrual depression. She was very well during pregnancy, breastfed for a year or more than a year, with good bonding for the child, but 19 months after the birth became depressed, not helped by drugs, and leapt out of the top window. Admitted to a hospital, a secure hospital, I think it was a prison actually, and many drugs for 20 years, including Venlafax and Lithium or whatever, had eight episodes of ECT. Um, not single, eight full episodes. Um, and there were some improvement these things, no longer suicidal. But then what happened, she was a lot better, not cured, she was a lot better. And then the psychiatrist in Nottingham um, refused any more psychiatric support for her if she was still having estrogens. Um, so she stopped having estrogens and she's now as bad as ever. So that's, that's the failure. There were eight characteristics of PMS to diagnose one from the other, not found in, not for, I'm trying to find the time. I'm, let me know if I'm talking too much to give you a wave. Um, to, to diagnose PMS from bipolar, pretty simple. I mean, depression leads to the menstrual cycle. Relief of depression during pregnancy, postnatal depression, PMDD when periods return, etc. PMDD worse with age, etc. Usually have these cytical symptoms. Now, um, I'm still in practice, and I see about five, I, I see mostly depressed patients now, not gynecology. And I have about five new patients a day, five new patients who've been buggered up by psychiatrists. And I know the answer to a few questions. Do you have PMS as a teenager? Do you have PMS, well during pregnancy, postnatal depression? I know I can almost cure all of them within three months or six months. So that's why I enjoy what I'm doing at the moment so much. And in later life, you see these women of 45. In later life, these depressed women, you'll say, when did you last feel well? <clears throat> and they last felt well in the last pregnancy, 10 years ago. And then things started to go downhill. The safety of estrogens for depression. Now, these are all young premenopausal women. And there's no evidence anywhere the transdermal hormones in young premenstrual women have any side effects. WHI now mostly discredited, and the authors now are queuing up to apologize for the mistakes they've made. Um, Million women study, no one believed that outside Oxford anyway. Um, transdermal root has no effect on hepatic coagulation factors. Minimal progestogen, and that's a, that is a risk factor in HRT, it's a progestogen. To give as little as possible, I use seven days of compromise or none if after hysterectomy. And long-term studies, the appropriate age group show fewer heart attacks, fewer cardiac deaths, and even less breast cancer. Safer and more effective than anti antidepressants who have these sort of side effects, strokes, heart disease, renal failure with lithium, weight problems, loss of libido, etc., etc., and they often don't work. This is just our paper on transdermal estrogens and, and postnatal depression. And I put this on because this is the tipping point. I see in the history of these women, they have PMS and whatever, they get over it or they don't or whatever. What goes wrong is they then get postnatal depression is not recognized as a hormonal problem, and they're put on ineffective antidepressing or antipsychotic drugs, then they're on the way down for the rest of their lives. Now, this is the audit of these patients I'm talking about. This is uncontrolled, but don't forget, all of the, all of the controlled studies have been published. 238 patients of mine, email questionnaire, they're a pretty bad bunch. 17 psychotic episodes, 71% had antidepressants prescribed, 17% mood stabilizing drugs, 
12% in inpatient for depression, 4% had ECT, and 14% had attempted suicide. Association of PMS and, and postnatal depression. Um, of those, 68% had PMS as a teenager. It's common. Those patients who've been pregnant in good mood without pregnancy, um, 89%. So these are the women that, that have been pregnant and good mood who had had depression in the past. And, uh, and 66% were well during pregnancy and had postnatal depression. And now for, for this idea of, of the psych psychiatrists in there, bipolar causing postnatal depression, that 58% of those pregnant suffered both premenstrual depression and postnatal depression. 58% premenstrual postnatal depression. And 92% of those that had been pregnant were very well during pregnancy. It mostly had the therapy by gels or implants, 93% always had testosterone. De progesterone intolerance, a big problem in women with PMS, because that's why they've got PMS. They don't like their own luteal phase progesterone. <clears throat> 59 patients had a marina inserted, and 40 had a hysterectomy, usually laparoscopic hysterectomy in BSO. Of those 40 that had a laparoscopic TH BSO, 38 was life-changing for the better. Other two didn't reply. 24 no longer on antidepressants. How did hormone therapy compare with antidepressants? 40 didn't have antidepressants, but of those, nearly all, 90% was better on the hormone therapy compared with antidepressants. And was hormone therapy life-changing for you? Yes, for the better. 94% no, 5.8%. Um, uh, so you mentioned I've written 500 papers. It's true. I know how to write good papers. I know how to write crap papers, too. But anyway, so I've sent two papers, including this one, to the British Journal of Psychiatry. And they're both returned, not even reviewed. They don't want to see, hear the message at all. Uh, finally, a couple of slides which we as wise gynecologists, this is a little test. HRT, a 50-year-old woman with flushes and sweats, vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, loss of libido, depression, and low bone density. How do we treat her? We treat her with estrogens, of course. Now, if they go and see anybody else, GPs, psychiatrists, or whatever, they will have a drug that I've invented called Profox. Profox is my nightmare of the future. And it's a combination of Prozac and Fosamax. Fosamax. Now, drugs with their own considerable side effects which are given out to this, this woman who certainly needs to have estrogens. Now, let's look at a 50-year-old woman with hot flushes. Well, they treat hot flushes now with venlafaxine, with, with antidepressants, would you believe it? Vaginal dryness, loss of libido. Oh, who cares? She's 50. She's old. You know, doesn't matter. Depression, antidepressants, low bone density, Fosamax. So that's the danger. Unless we really grasp the benefits and the safety of hormone therapy, more and more women are going to have this abomination, this this, this, this drug, what we call Profox, and my nightmare drug for the future. So there we are. Thank you very much.